Oh, I have to confess, I forgot that you were once my student. <laughs> no worries. Uh, it's a good thing that uh, you reminded me. Uh, secondly, I thought I muted my video and a lot of the participants here saw me moving about, uh, putting on this sweater because I am in a very cold room. And I even have to wear this, wear this because uh, I guess you will be dazzled by my brilliant head rather than by brilliance. And so I have to attend to all these kinds of things. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, the profan for an excellent, well-organized presentation. I will confess, I have not been aware of work on climate change. And the last part of your presentation would be so instructive as far as I'm concerned. And I will learn from you in so far as that topic is concerned. Um, I have recently retired from formal teaching and this uh, modality is entirely a new experience for me. And I thought that the best way to do this is to engage in a conversation. So look at this presentation as most likely a long stream, a long story of consciousness. The first thing I want to point out is international relations itself is so confusing. What is IR? Then we, I, I, I know Dr. Pham and you guys are familiar with this. There's this difference between lowercase IR and all caps IR and and our understanding is, at least when I was being instructed, that lowercase ir is real politics, whereas capital IR is supposed to be theory. Okay. That alone is confusing. And Mr. Benham further confuses us by inventing the concept or the label international relations, when in fact, what he's talking about would be the relationship between states. International relations mean relations between nations. And nations are not juridical concepts. States are. Nations are not. And therefore, the term itself is inappropriate. We are not examining relationships between nations. The more appropriate term would be interstate relations. Putting it in a larger context, the name proposed by Jeremy Benham stuck, became popular because the term interstate relations may disorient some people. I mean, the relationship within Florida and Alabama are the interstate relations in the context of a federalized nation state. So, that alone is already confusing. Uh, and Dr. Tom would know, I think you're based in Southern California. Oh no, the Bay Area. I used to be visiting professor in UC San Diego. That is intrastate within California. Then, I lectured in John Hopkins. When we relate to each other, suppose you were in San Francisco and I was in John Hopkins, 
we will be all uh, is no longer intra is now interstate so it's so confusing okay and perhaps the best way to do to put some order in it is to imagine the difference between the divide offered by Vespalia. There are states before Vespalia and the state model, the exemplar that is in being imposed to us is the Westphalian state, which is juridical, not ideational, not cultural, not area, and so on and so forth. Okay, and that that clear distinction between the Westphalian state, which is juridical. That is being imposed by the dominant West on all non-West. If you want to be treated as a state, you follow the Vesalian model. Otherwise, you're either a near state, pretend state, and so on and so forth. Okay. The point I want to make is that before Vesalia, there were states, but they did not look like the Vespalian. And this is true both in the West and in the East. In fact, I was assisted by your presentation, Dr. Pham. There was colonial IR even before Vespalia. Let's start with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is essentially a state, but it is not a nation state. It is an empire state. Okay. It did its colonialism. Colonialism, imperialism predates modern, modern states. So even at that period, Rome was already acting as a hegemon and impose discipline on the outskirts, started consolidating control in the Italian peninsula. Rome started as a city-state, but not Westphalian. Okay. So what does it, what did the Romans have to do? They have to conquer. They have to consolidate Italy. And then they moved further out, met all of these barbarians, the Celts, the Gauls, all oh, the implacable Germanic tribes, and so on and so forth. What was that process? That is imperialism, colonialism undertaken by an empire state, but not of the Westphalian mode. So the Celts perhaps may also complain, we need to decolonize our own history. No? Even guys in London were barbarians as far as the Romans are concerned. So the point I am trying to make here is that colonialism, imperialism, as we know it, predates the modern period, the modern times. Even before the current hegemons have emerged, the United States and so on and so forth, the things that they do, other, other guys, other strong, powerful states, empire states, uh, city states have been doing their thing and simply conquering, dominating, influencing uh, these barbarians and so on and so forth. That's also happening in the East. Huh? 
in in pre-Westphalian Japan, in pre-Westphalian China, the outskirts were referred to as populated by the equivalents of barbarians, the Gaijin. So imperialism, colonialism is not exclusive to the West as we know it. It's not also exclusive to the East. All of this, to my mind, all of these pre-Westphalian states of various sizes, various forms, have exercised some form of colonialism, imperialism vis-a-vis -vis what they would consider to be lesser people, less civilized, barbarians, gaijins, and so on and so forth. That's one. The other thing is that in both sides of the world, the sources of these ideas comes from religion, religious beliefs, uh, philosophical outlooks, and so on and so forth. Even in the West itself, what must be settled would be the multinational scope of the power of the church versus the defined limit of authority of the Westphalian state. So church and state, church represented by Vatican, and then you have the states which are emerging and consolidating themselves according to the boundaries we see that correspond to modern day France, modern day Britain, modern day Germany, and so on and so forth. These guys have do a lot of fighting, uh, intriguing, to some extent, even Vatican itself behaved like a secular state with its own army and so on and so forth. So you have a very interesting diversity of pre-Westphalian state behavior of all kinds of things. Okay. So the church, Vatican wanted to represent the whole of Christendom. That is not the Westphalian formula. The prince, let's say, or the king in England wanted to assert his authority, his secular authority over English subjects. And therefore, the Europe, these Europeans have to suffer the problem of divided loyalty. Who should I obey, my pope or my prince? Most often, that question is settled through violence. And the Thirty Years' War, all kinds of wars were all fought. And eventually, the influence of the church its power to capture the minds of people were weakened, particularly by the Renaissance, the Age of Enlightenment, and so on and so forth. And the emerging narrative in the West is the eventual triumph of the Westphalian mode, which is, again, juridical. What is clearly the juridical aspect of the Westphalian state? the notion of sovereignty, that the sovereign, the king of a state is the supreme authority within that state. The king's subject must not listen to that pope in the Vatican. So that was the concept of sovereignty. 
you may pray to your God, but when I tell you to do something, this is the king talking to his subjects, you must obey me, even if it's against your conscience. Otherwise, off with your head. Naturally, between a power who could cut off your head and is closer to you and a power in Vatican who will simply excommunicate you and prevent your entry from heaven, who would you most likely follow? After all, you're starting also to doubt whether there is life there's a next life. So between the threat of being excluded from the next life, coming from Vatican, and the threat of losing your head right now, coming from your king, I guess one does not need to be a rocket scientist to find out who you're going to follow. Okay. I think I am. That's something that I also have to expound at greater length, but I cannot do it because I want to move on to another. And that is the political and philosophical question, who should we obey? The question of obedience. And the question of obedience is, Essentially, a question of power is a question of responsibility, both on the part of the person who expects to be obeyed and the majority of persons who must obey. And immediately you see here a question of numbers. Those who demand obedience are few. Those who must obey are many. So it's the few dominating the many. Religion comes in to explain why this is the proper arrangement. In the West, you have divine right theory. We must obey because those who rule against us was a mandate from the gods. And there are three versions of this divine right theory. A very weak version. Uh, I'm a representative of, to cast it in modern terms, uh, consider God's uh, mobile phone directory. I'm there in his call list. That's weak. That's the weakest version of the divine right theory. The strongest version, no, no. Let me go to the stronger version. The top 10 in the directory of God, the top 10 in his list, I'm there. The weak version was, there is a long directory in God's mobile phone. I'm one perhaps of the 300 in the, in the stronger version, I am in the top 10. The strongest version is the monarch claiming I am God. This is the Morgan Freeman version. The monarch will say, you don't need to talk to God, you talk to me. I talk to you and I can talk to you and I can compel you to obey because I'm God. I'm trying to colloquialize these different versions of divine right theory, but I guess I'm trying to do it in a way uh, that I could be accessible because I don't know the audience. I don't know where they come from. Perhaps I, will, I can clarify this 
uh, at greater length or in a better way uh, in a QA. Okay. Now, this divine right theory is not exclusive to what we know as the West. Let's consider Japan, pre modern Japan. The Japanese emperor claims his authority through a long line of descent from the sun goddess Amaterasu. And that's why the Japanese flag is represented by either a, a big red dot in the center of the Japanese flag or a flag with rays that is representative of the sun. That is the symbol of the sun goddess Amaterasu. And the emperor of Japan up to Hirohito, when he was forced to denounce his uh, lineages, all of them justified their status as emperor because of this lineage. In Ethiopia, Emperor Haile Selassie traced his lineage to King Solomon and Queen Sheba. That is a, such a long line of claiming legitimacy until Mr. Selassie would be overthrown by Marxist and Marxist influence guerrilla fighters so ended the Ethiopian Empire. But that happened only in the 20th century. In China, the Chinese unified state is associated with Emperor Shi Huangdi. Before that, you had warring states. The, quite the parallel of the feudal wars and the intramurals in Europe. But then, Shi Wangti is now the king of kings. He emerged as the emperor of the Chinese empire. Okay. And the concept of celestiality the concept of mandate from heaven emerged to justify his consolidated rule. By the way, the Chinese empire is also racially based. It's Han. Huh? It's a Han state. Huh? The others were defeated, eliminated from aspiring to achieve such hegemonic status. Now let's talk about this mandate from heaven. An emperor can start a long line of dynastic succession, but then at one point in time, an upstart will defeat him and start a new dynasty. Why would that happen? Why would the emperor who is supposed to be the representative of God, why was he defeated? And the simple explanation is the defeated emperor lost the mandate of heaven and the new guy, the new emperor gained it. So that to my mind was a very skillful explanation on the part of the Chinese to trace the legitimacy of either long lasting dynasties or short lived dynasties. These things happen because these guys lost the mandate of heaven. So 
all of these practices, a diversity of practices, all coexisted. Sometimes the other side, the West, as we know it, is unaware of what's going on on the other side of the world. We still have to see the knowledge transfer, the awareness transfer between East and West. And the convenient storyline is Marco Polo. He bridged, he broke the knowledge gap. He told his Europeans, you think you're civilized? Look at China, they're more advanced. And they, do, they won't even bother trying to come here in order to conquer us. So you have separate from, even from the uh, pre-modern period, what is considered to be East, and what is considered to be West is separate. And following uh, Kennedy's schema of analysis, the West was really the primitive one, while the East was the civilized part of the world. And therefore, the civilized part of the world, like China, did not need to have knowledge of what is happening in the West. Why was the West interested in the East? They were simply interested in silk, spices, because their diets were bland. They only have salt. They don't have pepper. They don't have sugar. No? And they don't take a bath. And they just stay in their cold, castles, no? uh, they don't have air conditioning, they don't have climate control, or climate control in the castles. Meanwhile, the Westerner will be dazzled by what he will see in the court of Kublai Khan, Marco Polo. Money, Gunpowder, printing was invented in the East, not by John Gutenberg. No. Gunpowder, the smuggling of gunpowder from the East revolutionized warfare in the West. But at some point in time, the established East got too complacent while the upstarts in the West consolidated themselves and starting moving out and undertaking modern day or post-Westphalian imperialism and colonialism. So what the Romans did to the Celts, the Gauls, the Franks, the Visigoths and so on and so forth, these guys were now doing to who? The First Nations, the Incas, the Peru, the Aztecs in your part of the world. And then they looked downstairs, they started doing their numbers on Africans, Africans, tribes, Black people, ah, we can take care of them. They're just, they're just with spears. We have cannons, we have muskets, and so on and so forth. So the, the projection of hard power is a major aspect of modern day or modern nation state colonialism and imperialism. Okay, then the emerging hegemons like the Brits and soon the Americans turn their 
attention with great anticipation on pre-modern Japan and China. By that time, China was already fragmented, internally divided, and so on and so forth. Japan itself had to consolidate, modernize after the shogunate. In short, the basic tactic now on the part of the established and the rising imperialist hegemons in the West would be to divide and conquer the former hegemonic powers in the East. I'm talking about China. I'm talking about Japan. As you move downstairs to Southeast Asia, you have almost various levels of pre modern pre Westphalian states. I'm talking about Mandala states in Southeast Asia. Then you talk about maritime zones in the Sulu Sea and so on and so forth. This was the same situation faced by a unified, I'm trying to draw a map on my screen. China is here, downstairs would be Indochina and further down would be Southeast Asia where most of us are located. So closer to China, you have stronger states, stronger, this Indo-Chinese states were stronger in relation to the states downstairs in Southeast Asia. The center of consolidated state power is obviously China, the so-called celestial kingdom, the so-called middle kingdom. Okay. So the, the formula that emerges here is unlike the Roman Empire, unlike the British Empire. The Chinese, the Chinese emperor did not conquer and physically occupy the South, the Indochina states. Uh, I can't remember offhand, uh, Funan, uh, Champa, and so on and so forth. And then uh, further down the road, you have the Sultanate of Sulu and so on and so forth. How would all of these weaker states relate to the Chinese emperor? They have to pay tribute. They don't need to be conquered. And that those hierarchical arrangements between the hegemonic center in Beijing up to the court in Holo, Sulu, is what we can call not the classic Roman imperial system, but the tributary system. The lesser states will simply recognize that they owe some tribute to the Chinese emperor because he is the lord of the middle kingdom, the kingdom that mediates between all of the lesser kingdoms here downstairs and the kingdom of the gods. The Chinese emperor is the middle kingdom. It mediates between lesser kingdom in the Indo-Chinese Peninsula and the small mini states in Southeast Asia. In a certain sense, if you were a Sultan of Holo and you want a direct line to God, you cannot do that. You have to pass through the Chinese emperor. 
That is the concept of tributary systems. That is the concept of middle kingdom. And that is also supposed to be behind the concept of celestial kingdom. And the object of all this conceptualization of being the middle kingdom, the celestial kingdom is now the most, used to be the Chinese empire, which is now the, more or less, the modern Chinese state, as we know now, the People's Republic of China. So it is less clear cut in the East, whereas in the West, the formula, the mold that was being adopted is the Westphalian state mold, which is juridical, emphasis on sovereignty. What is sovereignty? Two aspects. You must be recognized sovereign within your boundaries, and you must be recognized as sovereign by other sovereign states. And therefore, no state has the right to interfere in your internal affairs. The, the Westphalian state system now defines what is internal and what is external, what is in and out. And therefore, the law that applies to internal affairs is municipal law. The law that applies to the relationship between states is international law. Unless you are recognized, if you're just a nation, you will get that kind of treatment. So that goes for such aspiring states as the Bangsamoro state. The Bangsamoro state claims to be the representative of the Bangsamoro people. Qua nation. It is a, as Ben Anderson says, it's an imagined community. Now, how can an imagined community gain a seat in the United Nations? The sure sign of that you have attained Westphalian status is that you have a seat, not an observer seat, but a full seat in the UN General Assembly. Even closer to, to Europe, that problem is best exemplified by Palestine. What status does Palestine enjoy in the eyes of the sovereign states? Is it a full member? I don't think so. The Israelis won't like that. The United States won't like that, and so on and so forth. Will the Bangsamoro nation attain statehood? They tried to do it. They tried to outright secede, but they failed. And yet, the Bangsamoro, by way of Miswari's MNLF, became a member of the OIC, the organization of this the Conference of Islamic States and Non-States. Why? Because Islam offers the notion of an ummah, the community of believers. We don't care where you are located as long as you bow down and pray to, towards the direction of Mecca five times a day, you are part of the Ummah, that concept of a community adhering to the Holy Quran, irrespective of location, gets resurrected. How? The modern caliphate. In what form? ISIS. IS, ISIL, what's the term they use? The DIS, 
D A E S H. These guys want to establish what is the equivalent of a modern state by way of actually occupying territory, projecting power, but they want to destroy existing boundaries. ISIL, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, IS. So what is happening here is a new possibility explored by people who don't want to adhere to the Westphalian mode, a mode imposed by the hegemons from the West. Now let's go to China. China tried to behave as a modern post-Westphalian state. It gained a seat in the UN. In fact, it gained a seat on the Security Council. It's trying to behave as a responsible member of the international community of states. And then it also chooses not to, does not want to accept rulings of the arbitral court with respect to the West Philippine Sea. And they say, we were not part of the process. So China behaves as a modern Westphalian state to my mind, when it suits itself and behaves in another way, as long as it suits itself, which brings down, all boils down to real politics, to Machiavellian real politics. I will do what is best so I can achieve my objectives. If I can get my objective by behaving according to the Western standard, then I will do so. If I cannot meet my objective following the Western formula, I will do it another way. It simply drives following the point, what is paramount from the point of view of the leaders of the Chinese state would be China's state national interest. I don't the Chinese leader of the state, of the, the leader of the Chinese state says, my primary responsibility is to my citizens. I do not owe any responsibility to the citizen of the United States, to the citizen of France, and so on and so on. Okay. Um, I might drift so far away uh, because I need to tackle the question Is there really a non Western international? relations theory. What we are seeing here is various forms of international relations as practiced. The basic question between theory and practice is practice changes Theory must be theorized is a product of a knowledge production and justification process. Whatever theory that is produced must justify the practice. Now, when there is conflict between theory and practice, what gives way? Will you scold practice and say, 
practice, you're not behaving according to theory. You don't do that. What has to happen is theory must change in order to justify changing practice. It's easier to do that. Do a mental experiment. When you do something consistently, you can use that consistent behavior to come up with a theory that explains why you behave that way. But then suddenly you change what you're doing. Your old justification no longer applies to your new practice. Should you now scold yourself, hey, you guy, hey, myself, you're not behaving according to your theory. Isn't the easier way to do things is that, hey, theory, you're not justifying me. It's easier that I change you rather than you scold me and try to change me. I think that's a better point. Okay. So even this debate between theory and practice now raises the question, what is really theory? What is really practice? Can you really make a neat divide between theory and practice? Does the concept praxis, supposedly the unity of theory and practice, should that be better encapsulate what's going on? to be able to explain the changing state practice of rising hegemons like China, behaving this way in one way, behaving that way in that way, flexible behavior. And then because of that flexible behavior, it's going to be scolded by the, the previous hegemons. Those hegemons who are facing the challenge of the new hegemons. This is especially true for the US and China. There's a new Cold War between China and the US, which is so unlike the classic Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. What's the basic difference? The Soviet Union and the United States were clearly enemies. Now, China and the US, to use Facebook language, they're frenemies. They're friends and enemies at the same time. And therefore, they're frenemies. Uh, again, using Facebook, their relationship is complicated. They are united in certain ways. They differ and oppose each other strategically in another way. Precisely because there were clear, mutually beneficial economic relationships between US and China. China made use of its economic relationships with the West in order to lift itself out of mass poverty and to attain the status that it has attained now. I think you know this, uh, Dr. Fang, if you visit Shanghai, if you visit Shenzhen, you try to compare the bustling metropolises there compared to the tired areas in New York. So the centers of light, power, etc. used to be in the West. Now, the dynamic of the world's economic activity has shifted to the East, largely because the East, particularly China, particularly Deng Xiaoping after the death of Mao, 
invited the West to practically strengthen China. Okay. All of these experiences indicate that it's really so difficult to insist on your definition of what theory should be, of what international relations should be, following a formula that is imposed by the British and the American hegemons. Okay. Meanwhile, in many parts of the world, a lot of free states, pretend states, and so on and so forth, want to attain the Westphalian mode. Palestine would want to be a full-blown Westphalian state so that it can earn its seat in the UN General Assembly. How about the disappeared states in Central Asia? Uh, Armenia, uh, even in, in Canada. At one point, the, the people in Quebec wanted to separate itself as a sovereign state secede from English-speaking Federation of Canada. Now it has re they have realized that they, it's better to stay within the context of elsewhere in Europe. The Scots one are thinking of getting out of the United Kingdom. The Catalans get want to get out of Spain. You have all kinds of examples, and all of these are related to. Larger questions like Brexit uh, and so on and so forth. Also, because the Europeans themselves are redefining what the post Westphalian state should be from being sovereign nation states, they either want to be a region state, a United States of Europe. That was the dream. That is the political wet dream, especially when the guys in Brussels. But they're reminded that's not going to happen in the immediate future. The Greeks contemplated getting out. Before Brexit, there was Grexit. Grexit. The Greeks were having great troubles. The prosperous Northern countries, Germany and the Dutch didn't want to finance the idle uh, La Dolce Vita, Italians, the Portuguese, Spain, uh, Greeks, and so on and so forth. So you have well-disciplined, financially disciplined Northern states, Germany, Sweden, et cetera, et cetera, castigating guys downstairs who want to enjoy long lunches, uh, siestas, uh, holidays, and so on and so forth. Next, you have Britain getting out. So even in the West, the configuration of the state being formed there, we thought it was set in stone. It is not. So why should anybody be imposing a mold that does not seem to be tenable, that does not seem to be universally recognized as being efficient, effective in today's highly globalized, highly volatile, fast changing. We talk about Bitcoin. Is Bitcoin associate, you usually associate 
currencies with nation states. Now, Bitcoin, who creates Bitcoins? Individuals, super secret individuals. If that is the case, the trajectory there is that the nation state will be abolished. Only because in the, the Westphalian formula, only central banks can create currency. Now you have some guy creating a Bitcoin. Who's that guy? So you have, again, a transnational, cross-national, whatever national virtual cyber world creating currency, bypassing central banks, ministries of finances, and so on and so forth. It's really difficult. I am so overwhelmed by the complexity of all of these things that are happening. And on it is a, uh, uh, yeah, Rolly, of, yeah, please I'm stop sorry. me. Uh, I think a good number of our participants would now like to engage in the conversation with those points raised by Dr. Farm and yours. So uh, I hope it's all right with you if I... Uh, no problem. I, I warn you. Yes. <laughs> I can go on because uh, I debated uh, with myself whether I should follow <laughs> Dr. Pham's formula okay. or allow me to respond to her and then develop what I have in my mind. The things that I dropped when I was still teaching. Oh, yeah, so, maybe we can uh, have more of those in the forthcoming uh, discussions. But uh, I think our attendees right now would also like to uh, pose some questions with uh, both of you. And, okay, uh, uh, no problem. Uh, sorry, huh? Uh, I return you back to Danae. 